Hey, Dan. How's it going, Steve? All good. A little different uh, background ambiance. It's time uh, spring is coming around down here. <laughs> I set up my computer outdoors in the park, so. <laughs> We've got uh, some green and um, yeah, still mostly brown and gray and uh, yellow, but first time hitting 70 today, proper barefoot weather, so. Nice. Yeah. All right, um, so welcome back, Steve. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of your, uh, your role in this conference is to present the, the broader eco-ag, biological ag paradigm perspective. You started off at the beginning with, uh, um, I think you had it broken down by minerals, biology, and, and vibration or- and Energy, <laughs> yes. Energy, yeah. So that you gave the broad strokes last time and this time it's gonna be minerals. Then next time in two months will be um, biology and then finally we'll deal with energy. So um, take it away. Okay, great. So let me see if I can, hang on just a second guys. So let me do a uh, screen share and uh, let me try this. So this is a good opportunity to go back and review uh, eco-agriculture and, and do a primer on where it came from and why it's become so prominent in, in alternative farming systems and specifically why it has developed a very sophisticated approach to minerals and biology and producing really healthy foods. So that is the introduction. Uh, uh, that is um, a, a picture from our research farm in the organic farming section at University of Kentucky. We have both conventional and organic research there at the research farm. So let's start off with, um, first, let us recognize that organic versus conventional is a false dichotomy. It's very popular for the media and for discussion groups to try to you know, categorize farms as being all the same, et cetera. And uh, the way that research is done, it's, you know, they look at organic versus conventional, but in reality, there's farmers are, are more varied. Um, I've got this saying that there's 101 reasons why farmers do things. And, and by the same token, there's 101 reasons why researchers do things, which may not be apparent to people who, if you don't work in agriculture. Uh, but in Alternative farming, that is, um, includes a number of different systems, and each one of these have usually have had a, a pioneer, a visionary, who've come up with the, the concepts and methods, and then you've had a, a string of, of teachers and then a lot of practitioners. Um, if you look at this, a lot of this is, is farmer-driven. These innovations have come from innovative farmers who figured things out, so uh, we went through this at the introduction, but I'm just going to go over a few slides here to, to, to you know, remind us of what we're talking about. So sustainable, big with USDA uh, in the 1990s, um, the SERI program, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, started putting money into research and it really catapulted um, sustainable agriculture in the, amongst the land-grant universities. Organic, that includes both the larger kind of organic agriculture as well as the more codified USDA, you know, NOP, National Organic Program, which is certified organic. Permaculture, uh, ecological design system, very big on a worldwide basis. Then you have nature farming in Japan and nature farming in Korea and nature farming in India. Each one of those have a set of on-farm microbial preparations that are cultured from local biomass resources. And, and, and then they make these rich biofertilizers that, and double, and that double also as pest control. So um, that's probably, there's so much activity around Korean natural farming going on right now. And then uh, holistic grazing, integrated crop livestock. It's really the basis of a sustainable agriculture all through every civilization is integration of crops and livestock working together. Biodynamic agriculture, really big in Europe, big in the United States, Europe, um, Australia, et cetera, New Zealand. Um, and then we come down to today's topic, which is eco-agriculture. It's got a big history around the Acres USA magazine and trade show. And then the pioneers like Albrecht and Reams and Callahan. But what's interesting, and I've added one here is the 
what is common amongst all of these alternative farming systems is that farmers and have really strive to develop a local healthy foods and food system. And they've always reacted to toxic chemistry and tried to figure out how we can get non-toxic pest control working on the farm. And then designing agro ecosystems that mimic nature, taking advantage of biodiversity, of mulches, uh, intercropping and, and using um, that model to pr promote a healthy food production system. Then a big emphasis on organic and biological soil amendments and all of that leads to a healthy consortia of beneficial microorganisms. So then we talked about Acres USA in the introduction. I'm gonna go over that quickly again. So to put this into context, um, the, uh, the magazine itself has been around for 50 years and this summer actually of 2021. So started in 1971. Then the trade show has been going on for 45 years. So uh, that's a long time. And I forgot to mention that the founder of Acres USA was an ag journalist. And so this is interesting that one, one individual catapulted this whole um, coalition of people to come together and develop this system. And if you read back through Charles Walter's work, he, when he describes equal agriculture, he's talking about ecological and economic. That's really what it boils down to. Eco agriculture, eco farming was very popular back in the 70s as a term. And, uh, and so now what's interesting is that uh, the sort of the eco agriculture from Acres USA has been influential and it has resulted in uh, spin offs with the Eco Farm Conference in Asilomar. Actually, Bob Contisano, who was, who was like, you know, the co founder of CCOF co-founder of Eco Farms, founded Peaceful Valley Farm Supply. He actually said he went to the Acres Conference in the Midwest, but said, you know, it's kind of Midwestern, had that Midwestern feel, kind of conservative. You know, it's the West Coast, organic agriculture is a little hipper. And so an Eco Farm Conference is, it's like the Mecca of, of organic agriculture on, on the West Coast. But anyways, Dan Kittredge, you know, our friend Dan was, was uh, also a frequent visitor of Acres USA and has gone on to establish the Bionutrient Food Association. And then John Kempf, who a lot of people know of, is one of the top consultants in eco-agriculture, has started his own company called Advancing Eco-Agriculture. And then we talked about how it's the concept of standing on the shoulder of giants. And we have a number of pioneers. We have teachers and consultants. Uh, so the pioneers like William Albrecht, Kerry Rames, Maynard Murray, Bargila Retiever. And by the way, Bargila, that was, um, someone asked about that. That was called endocytosis, where she figured out that, that plants um, take in large molecules, not just ions. Phil Callahan, Elaine Ingham, et cetera. A lot of teachers. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, these teachers, a lot of these would be people who have studied under the pioneers uh, and are following, for example, the Albrecht soil fertility system or the Reams fertility system, or have integrated a lot of soil biology that Elaine Ingham brought out in the 1990s and so on. Quick, quick re uh, reminder there. And then I guess I should mention that uh, uh, the other thing I would could say about eco-agriculture that's interesting is that it is like a um, post-college education for farmers and for adults because the way that the traditional eco-farming seminar works is that you would spend three or four days with one of these consultants or teachers who will go in depth into, for example, just soil biology for four days or just Albrecht mineral balancing for four days soil testing, foliar fertilization, et cetera. So that's really helpful to put in perspective. And then, uh, I, like I said, a few slides for introduction. Well, one of our pioneers was William Albrecht. He was um, a premier soil scientist at University of Missouri. And uh, upon his, his retirement, he helped Brookside Labs become a commercial lab. He was influential on early Acres USA. But Albrecht's theme was that the geography soil organic matter, percent calcium, percent cation uh, saturation, 
mineral balancing and trace elements are all major factors that lead to nutrition and health. And then another thing that Acres USA was put out what is known as the Albrecht papers. And so in the early years, there were two volumes, then they added two more volumes, and now uh, they've actually got up to eight volumes. And I can't even think of another scientist who has a whole series of volumes just collected with all their papers. So, uh, but this is a compilation of, of Albrecht's science journal papers and articles from ag and health periodicals between the 1920s and 1970s that link livestock and human health to soil fertility. These, these volumes are really a mashup of papers that are grouped together by topic, not not really in chronological sequence, which um, is helpful if you kind of dissect it back out. Also, the citation to the original source is not always clear. So sometimes if you look at the papers and then go back and study his bibliography and the journal articles, it actually becomes clear that this is a really solid um, series of papers that where he elucidated this theme. So the theme is, is that a declining soil fertility due to a lack of organic matter, both major elements and trace elements is responsible for poor crops. And in turn, for pathological conditions in animals and humans fed deficient foods from these soils. So that's a constant theme with Albrecht. He was really a soil scientist who stepped outside of his box and tied together human health and livestock health with soil fertility and how to improve the fertility and where you live, what the geography where you live, the rainfall patterns where you live, the, the geology where you live, all of those factors are important. The other pioneer that is really important to put into context because so much of our soil testing and, and the way that we approach soil fertility and foliar fertilization was Kerry Reams. And Kerry Reams was, he actually studied as a, as a medical student. He, he went to medical college. He ran a medical laboratory down in Florida in the early 1930s. And then things shifted and he, and he switched over to working at, and, and ran a agricultural library. I mean, I'm sorry, agricultural laboratory. So that was because he started, had you know, more or less patients or people that were coming to him for health reasons. And he felt like the best way that he could support their health is to raise nutritious foods. And so an important, thing to note there is that uh, a couple of things there about reams is that you notice there it says all disease is the result of a mineral deficiency or loss of mineral energy in plants, animals, and humans. And the other thing is that what's unique about reams is that it wasn't just these elements that are feeding the plant and making them healthy. He talked about the energy of ionization from these elements and how they have a, the spin of the you know, electrons in the micro voltage and how to put those together is what gives the plant energy and produces healthy foods, not just the chemical response itself. Now, the thing about Reams is that he also did human health and that's what is known as the Reams biological theory of ionization. And this is one of the um, summaries that he would use with his patients and they would measure things like the urine and saliva for with a refractometer, the pH and electrical conductivity meters. They also would measure nitrate nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen for urea. And then based on these numbers, these, these consultants could tell you a whole lot about the health of the person. Um, you know, it talks about their a whole string of things that would indicate are they in are they gaining energy are they losing energy what's their health status and on, with some of these experienced consultants and and medical uh, you know consultants they can really tell you a lot with that so that was really unique uh, so then here's we the we talked about um, reams had a optimum soil test levels. This will be the kind of a soil test based on a Morgan extract. So, you know, you're looking at the calcium and magnesium ratio. You have 
phosphate to potash. Sometimes that's two to one, sometimes it's one to one. An interesting thing, you'll see that nitrate, nitrogen, and ammonium, uh, nitrogen are considered really ideal at one to one. They talk about the sulfate levels, the ergs meet reading or the electrical conductivity reading, the pH, the sodium. Now, what was interesting too about Reams was that Einstein talked about splitting the atom to create massive energy. And what Reams was talking about was creating mass from energy. So that's, um, that was his thing. And he talked about the energy that would be derived from the resistance between cations and anions. So that's really helpful to understand. And then uh, a real unique contribution of Reams, and this is popular now in eco-agriculture and organic farming, all kinds of farmers do this nowadays, is he took a refractometer, which measures the soluble solids, which is usually sugars, but it also includes amino acids and, and uh, organic acids. And it's measured on a scale uh, there, you can see from, from zero through 22 or whatever that is, yeah, and 24. Anyway, so the, um, then it, he, had a, he had a rating of poor, average, good, and excellent. And so if you had an apple that has a poor reading of six versus one of 18, I mean, you can definitely tell the difference. You know, you're, you know if you talk about uh, summer squash or cabbage or carrots or bell peppers, all of these different things, um, you can tell the difference. And that's why, you know, like sometimes you, you get a tomato in the supermarket in the wintertime and it doesn't really have a lot of flavor versus, you know, you get one in the summer times, it's fresh, it's local, it's been fed well, it's got a lot of flavor. So there's a lot there, not only flavor, but the, but the minerals that are associated with that. Okay, so that's the quick introduction. And then, so that brings us to, now this is the three pillars of eco-agriculture, and this is my own interpretation of, a, of the primer. This is what Acres USA asked me to give a lecture on one time, and this is how I broke it down. And simply uh, because it's a, an easy way for farmers to, to grasp this and put it in a, in a category they can, can use. So that would be the minerals, biology, and energy are the three pillars of eco-agriculture, and today's lecture is on the minerals. So that includes things like soil testing and rock dust, sea minerals, mineral balancing, foliar fertilization, and fertigation. So we're going to look at, uh, we've talked about the tenets of eco-agriculture, and so first we're going to look at mineral depletion of soils and foods, the importance of minerals and trace elements in human health, and a decrease in mineral content of fruits, vegetables, and grains over decades. So let's look at that one first. And we're gonna start with um, a really uh, highly quoted document, Senate document number 264 from, I think that was 1941. And it really was an article about Dr. Charles Northern. And Northern actually was one of the people who inspired Kerry Reams to understand the importance of minerals and the importance of energy in raising crops. So Northern talked about how minerals are vital to human metabolism and that um, they, you know, plants and animals really need them. They can't get by with proper health unless they are fed a full smorgasbord of minerals and trace elements. And then what's helpful if you're into digging around is that he has two patents that you can easily find online. And, a, and an easy way to do that is look at free patents online and look up uh, Dr. Charles Northern. There's just two patents. And if you look at him, what he's describing is humus and colloidal rock phosphate that are blended with specific amounts of calcium and magnesium and trace elements like copper, zinc, iodine, boron, and, and manganese. So you can see that from early on, 1930s and 40s, this really set a pattern moving forward. And a lot of people refer to this and use this as a bellwether. So another thing that has been done, a number of people have looked at the depletion of minerals and trace elements in fruits and vegetables and grains and so forth over decades of time. And so there's been several papers. This one is a really good one. This was published in a journal in 2007. And if you look at fruits and vegetables, look at the difference between 1940 and 1991. So you'll see um, in vegetables, 
uh, decrease of calcium up to 46%, magnesium like almost 25%, and then um, iron almost 30%, and a, almost, I mean, 75, 76% decrease in copper. And then also in, in vegetables, you see a 20% drop in copper, almost a 25% drop in iron and so forth. So, and like I said, there's been several journal articles that have been done on this. So this, is, this has been pretty well documented. Uh, and then other people have made the correlation of the decrease in minerals in our food with an increase in degenerative diseases. And so this one was from August Dunning, who is well known because he had the sea minerals called Ecovi, and he correlated the disease with depleted food minerals. He did all this by looking through the archives of the CDC, National Institute of Health and American Heart Association. So you see heart conditions between 1980 and 2011, 400% increase, asthma over 4,000% increase, um, et cetera. And then you see a, a number of mineral deficiencies that are associated with those disease conditions. And I've seen other people present similar data at different conferences. So that's really helpful to put in perspective about the importance of minerals. And then let's look at some of the functions of major, secondary, and trace elements. So uh, if we look at calcium, essential component of bones and teeth, and a role in me metabolic processes. Magnesium is an essential cofactor in over 300 enzymes. Potassium and sodium are both important in regulating body water and blood pressure. Phosphorus is a, in, a critical component of ATP energy molecule. And sulfur is an essential component of methionine and cysteine amino acids. And then if we look at some of the trace elements, zinc uh, is an, uh, and um, manganese are both important cofactors in enzymatic reactions. Uh, then you've got iron, essential component you know, in blood, hemoglobin, and uh, et cetera. So cobalt, essential in the structure of vitamin B12. And you don't need very much cobalt, but sometimes just a little extra cobalt, foliar applied to um, different forages and legume cover crops, et cetera, can be really helpful. And then let's look at Linus Pauling and, and talk about what he came up. One of the terms that Linus Pauling came up with and promoted was orthomolecular. And orthomolecular is preventing disease with optimum levels of minerals, vitamins, and nutritional substances. And so another, you know, Linus Pauling was interesting because he's one of the only people who have gotten two Nobel Prizes. He got the first Nobel Prize for elucidating the structure of vitamin C, and he got the second Nobel Prize for um, nuclear proliferation and uh, working towards um, uh, on, for that purpose, for the peace purposes. And so, and then Riordan Clinic in Kansas is really big on orthomolecular. So if you wanted to find out more, that would be the best place to go to. And then Don Huber, who is one of the pioneers, who has, is still an active speaker at Acres USA, um, was a plant pathologist at uh, Purdue University, is well known for decades of solid research and scientific findings, and is known for mineral nutrition and plant disease, big textbook. And so for example, let's look at zinc on the lower left there. You can see this is uh, rhizoctonia winter kill in wheat and the effect of zinc deficiency. And you can see a big difference there. If the soil is deficient, there was greater incidence of this disease. And then if you apply the zinc in proper amount, it, it would offset the disease by having the proper nutrition. Now, a lot of people talk about root exudates. It's like the buzzword of soil health and regenerative agriculture. Or like root exudates, this is so amazing. Uh, and it is, it's really cool that, that plants photosynthesize, they make carbohydrates, and then they, those develop into proteins and amino acids and organic acids and so forth. And the plant leak, leaks those out. They do that, they, they do feed the soil food web, but in another way that's not always beneficial. And this one shows you that, so that you can see that if the, um, I, think, I think that's wheat and apple, if they were deficient in zinc, then the amount of organic compounds that were leaked out were greater than if they were 
they were fed zinc in the proper amounts. So put that in perspective. Then um, I'm going to throw in remineralization at this point because uh, we talked about it in the last lecture, but I will say that um, a lot of people associate adding minerals in, to, to soil fertility and organic farming. Think of remineralization. This became really a big topic in the 1970s and onwards because of the work of John Hamaker and because of the work of remineralize the earth. And so this um, talks about using rock dusts and sea solids and sea minerals. All of these have over 70 elements. And we have, you know, we have, we have major elements, we have secondary elements like sulfur and magnesium. We have trace elements like boron and copper, iron and zinc and so forth. And then there's another category called ultra trace elements. And there's just a huge number of these, gold, silver, scandium, yttrium, uh, beryllium, that uh, we do not consider to be plant essential elements. And yet, because of the way the earth evolved and because plants and microbes grew up in a, in a mineral rich environment, we believe that these have a, uh, an, an influence on plant metabolism and can sometimes influence secondary plant metabolites or antioxidants or give some kind of vitality to the plant in such minute quantities that all that is required, for example, is to just spray the crop one time with, with ocean minerals, with sea minerals, or just apply some rock dust uh, to the soil. So that's, that puts that into perspective. And then there's some really great books to draw upon. Maynard Murray, he was one of the pioneers. He was another medical doctor. He was actually, I think he was in Cleveland, Ohio. And um, then he had, he had patients, they had health problems. And he started working with nutrition and trace elements and came to the realization that sea solids are really an awesome source of these broad spectrum trace elements and so forth. So he he worked with those. He's actually got a patent that describes how many, how, how many pounds you should use. The, this is one of his books, um, Sea Energy and Agriculture. And then Charles Walter has one, Sea Concentrate in Abundant Agriculture. That's from the Sea Crop um, uh, Company up in Washington State. Very good with more recent research. Enliven Rock Powers from Harvey Lyle and The Power of Minerals by Paul Bergner. Those are all really good books to be aware of. Okay, then now let's look at the second tenet. So we, we went through uh, the importance of minerals and on the mineral depletion of um, soils and foods. So let's look at nutrient dense foods. So how to grow, how to measure. And the whole concept there is food is medicine. So let's see what we got. So this one, uh, Michael Estero, uh, he, he was an engineer who has a, had a real eye for meticulously analyzing um, things. And so he, he dug through the Albrecht literature and the different uh, soil testing laboratories and came up with a system called the ideal soil. And for several years, he ran a high bricks mineralization project, um, you know, project. I was actually involved in that. What we did, this was a grassroots effort. We had gardeners, we had farmers. And what we would do is do a soil test through Logan Labs we would do a mineralization scheme. We would amend the beds with all these minerals. We would grow out a crop and then we would take like summer squash or kale or tomatoes or watermelon or whatever. And we would send it to a lab for actual mineral composition of the food composition. And then we would compare that to USDA average amounts of mineral composition and, and look at the difference. And to put in perspective, the way that uh, we know how minerals uh, have declined over decades is because USDA in the United States and, and other agencies, for example, in England or, or Australia have monitored the mineral composition and, and fat and protein, et cetera, content of vegetables over decades. And so you can dig up and download these USDA agriculture handbook on composition of food, they've got them on vegetables, they got them on fruits, 
And for example, you can get one from the 1950s and then you can get the latest update was in the 1980s. So that's 30 years, three decades of a comparison. And then everything nowadays in, in, in uh, 2020 roughly is uh, in a database that you can, you can download and get these comparisons. And so in this, in this example, um, uh, let's see. So <laughs> let's see, okay, there we go. I had to do a little thing with my Zoom screen. So you can see like, look at the difference when uh, this was a gardener who raised some beets and he did the mineralization scheme. He got the bricks level of 11 and where 12 is considered excellent. And on calcium, he was 900% over USDA standard. Magnesium, he was over 100% over USDA. And zinc over 150, copper over 140. And so, yeah, you can see the difference there. That was all very interesting. And it's pretty, it's very different. No, hardly anybody does this. I mean, we raise crops and we base our thinking on yields most commonly. But like Albrecht, and what eco-agriculture is saying is that our aim is to raise healthy, nutritious foods that people can eat that function as food as medicine. So that's one example. Let's look at another example. So Jim Porterfield is an ag researcher in Illinois who is also an ideal soil consultant and worked uh, with the Astera system, the ideal soil system. And this was... Um, a project he worked with at Ladybug Farms. I think that was in Georgia. And then, so they did the, the soil test, they added the mineralization scheme, and then they grew the vegetables, and then they harvested them and sent them to a lab for analysis. And so that this one, I think that's also on beets. And let's see, I think if, yeah, I've still got that screen up there. Let's see. <laughs> Uh, I still have a Zoom toolbar at the top of my screen, so sometimes I can't see the top everything. So anyways, that's beets. And look at the difference there. So that's iron, over 300% greater amount of iron compared to the USDA standard on zinc, over 100, almost 130% compared to the USDA standard, and in calcium is greater, et cetera. So that's the first example. The second one is produce raised at Ladybug Farm that has been amended with minerals compared to beets that were bought at a grocery store from California. And so in this example, they're just comparing Georgia to California. One would be mineralized and the other one was just organic beets that are you know, from the grocery store. So in this example, zinc is over 300%, magnesium and calcium are over 200% greater, and iron is over 1000% greater than store bought beets that are coming out of just run-of-the-mill California agriculture organic beets. So that was very interesting. And this kind of thing that you can do. This is like, again, this is grassroots. Now, here's an example. This one is from the Ream system. This was the work of John Frank uh, when he was working with International Ag Labs, which is one of the Reams labs uh, that Dan Scow started. And he did a nutrient-dense uh, grow-out trial. He had at least uh, almost 30 entries there, and they did butternut squash. And he did, ran them through the lab, and then he ranked them from 1 through 29. And so the, the top ranking submittal was from a gardener in northwest Arkansas named Calvin Bay. Actually, Calvin was a friend of mine. I lived there and would go visit his garden. He was a really, he was a really great gardener. He was actually a retired USDA Forest Service Administrator. And then he, he had a, an energy efficient home in a garden. And so he tried all this out. And so you can see he had the high reading for the nutrient dense score. He had a BRICS reading of 12. The highest one in the whole trial was 14. He had the highest level on dry matter percentage and protein and phosphorus and magnesium uh, um, on potassium there. I can't see magnesium because that thing's in the way. And then uh, you can see that it goes down through here. Here's the nutrient dense standards. This would be what they consider to be ideal or minimum. And then you go down and you, you go through different grocery stores, et cetera, and look at the bottom entry. <laughs> the bottom entry was organic baby food. 
Uh, so that is why you can see that it's got low levels uh, in, of these different minerals and, and composition. And this is why people are interested in this. I mean, what is the food supply that we are getting delivered to us from, from California, from the, the supermarket? In our area, we have, you know, we have, we have IGA, we have, you know, different, uh, you know, grocery stores. They have Wegmans on the East Coast. What are you getting off the, you know, off the wholesale supply of fruits and vegetables coming out of different parts of the country where it's more or less industrialized agriculture? And um, how does that match up with nutrient dense? And can we, as, as gardeners, as farmers, can we do, a, can we understand the soil fertility? Can we bring back a suite of minerals? and manage the soil fertility to raise nutrient dense crops. That's what this is talking about. And then this is the work of Dan Kittredge. Are you there, Dan? Yeah. Okay, so this is, um, this is Dan's work at uh, the Bionutrient Food Association, which I think was really interesting. This was some analysis of uh, spinach. They did spinach, they did carrots, and they did a suite of analysis. They looked at a number of different samples and then looked at the, um, the composition of spinach leaves, for example, iron. And so in one, one example, they found the high level of iron versus the low level of iron. And so there, and this would be what you can get off the supermarket shelf, for example, or from a scattering of different farms. And so basically what he's saying is that it would take 14 spinach leaves of the mineral level in the low sample to be equivalent to the iron level in the high sample. The same thing with magnesium, or this one is manganese. In this one, it would take 16 leaves at the low level to be equivalent to manganese in the high level. So this range is common, and a lot of this depends on your geography. It depends on your soil type. It depends on the inherent ge geology of where your soil developed from. And then also you have uh, varietal differences. Uh, you have rainfall patterns, but ultimately it also depends on your soil fertility scheme. So that is a big background to understanding this is what's going on, what are these levels, and how can we improve on the system? And then also look at the difference between antioxidants. So we talked about antioxidants like phenols, lycopene, flavonoid, all these are really beneficial for our health and they fight free radicals and degenerative diseases. And in this example, it would take 100 leaves on the low end to be equivalent to the, the high end spinach antioxidants. Okay, so now we're down to, uh, we're gonna look at um, crop vitality and pest control, the metabolic approach. And when we say the metabolic approach, we're talking about, basically we're looking at mineral balancing and trace elements and tweaking the mineral system to be healthy. So uh, we looked at, we talked about uh, Francis Chabalchou. He was a pathologist in France. Uh, he was a scientist. He talked about a paradigm shift where we get away from toxic chemistry by building a healthy plant to uh, ward off insects and diseases by, by focusing on its nutritional status. And so he, he thought, you know, that kind of leads to monitoring the plant sap and looking at how you can, and the ratio between elements and how you can promote the transformation of amino acids to proteins and from simple reducing sugars to polysaccharides. So one example would be Bruce Tainio. That we, sh we should look at this example. This is Bruce Tainio. He was an eco-ag consultant and product manufacturer. And he talked about plant pH sap and how the ideal uh, pH uh, sap is 6.4. And if it's higher than that, you're gonna have more insect disease, uh, insect problems. And if the pH is more acidic, it's lower than that, you're gonna have more disease problems. And so this one is kind of a conceptual chart to explain things that EcoAg people have looked at and used. There's plant meters you can test sap with for pH. You can also test the plant sap with 
EC, electrical conductivity, and you can also test the plant sap with bricks uh, for, with a refractometer. And then John Kemp with Advancing Ecoagriculture has the Plant Health Pyramid, which talks about increasing resistance to insects through a series of improving the carbohydrate metabolism and protein, lipids and fats that build that make up the plant uh, waxy tissue and then phytoalexins and increasingly difficult diseases and in insects to control. And so this is all done through really good fertility, really good biology working for you and then monitoring. And John is using the plant sap analysis uh, method along with the soil test to monitor the crop and work with growers and improve the, the really health of the plant. And he has a whole one day workshop on this that he uh, uh, helps to educate growers. This is an example from Reggie Destry. He was a crop consultant for Dram Liquid Fish. And this one was aphids on soybean, soybean. So look at this. So um, let's look at the bottom down here. We'll see uh, over 3,500 3, aphids that were occurring uh, in his uh, analysis on his monitoring in the crop. This is in the field during the growing season. And if you look at the sap pH, it's 5.3, and the bricks is very low, 5.7. And then it, it decreases over time um, up, up to this point where you end up with very, very few aphids occurring on the soybean leaves. And then you see the plant sap is at 6.2, which is very close to ideal. And the bricks is up over nine. So that's what he's showing you is the SAP pH, the SAP bricks, and the SAP electrical conductivity. And he's talking about these levels and how to get there. So that was a really good example of some field work. And then this was an example of a foliar program that Reggie, he put out these for a number of years. And so in this example, you've got in uh, what, 15 gallons of water, you've got some biologicals, so you've got some compost tea, that's uh, agri-energy resources, the SP1, that's their compost extract, and a consortia of microbials that they've developed. Um, that's an option of you know, adding some biology in there. Then you've got some protein nitrogen with uh, fish hydrolysate. You've got some potassium, some trace elements, you've got some neem working for you, and that's a foliar program. Then here's another one. That I've, dig around looking for foliar fertilization recipes. I really like this one because this is from a farmer in Maryland. And if you look at this one, he's, he's kind of putting together a reams program here. So he's got in uh, per gallon, he's got molasses, he's got soda, which is adding phosphoric acid. He's got a little hydrated lime for calcium. He's got some protein nitrogen with liquid fish. He's got some seaweed, which is adding all kinds of trace elements, right? And then apple cider vinegar. You put all that together, sprayed it out there, and got a great bricks reading on sweet corn. Uh, I got 20, 28 bricks on sweet corn, which is outrageous. Uh, yeah, that scale goes up to 32, by the way. So that was a, a, a nice um, example. And now we're down to the last uh, tenant of eco-agriculture. This one is the monitoring and, and uh, modification towards the metabolic approach. That includes the holistic soil test, and then a number of different mon uh, meters that you can use in the field with lab testing, et cetera. And I might point out, let me point out down here, um, you'll see uh, the petiole analysis and sap analysis. Now sap analysis, like I mentioned, this is the one that John Kempf has popularized. There's a, a lab in the Netherlands that is actually offering this. And uh, so this is a way that growers can monitor the status of minerals and trace elements in the crop during the growing season, which is different from a tissue test. A tissue test is like a snapshot, but a sap analysis tells you what's going to happen. Uh, and it's just more accurate. The other thing is that the petiole analysis is another one. Um, it's actually been around a long time. This one is offered through Texas Plant and Soil Lab down in Southern Texas. And this was something that Kay Chandler uh, developed. Uh, and this one is very similar. I've actually used this with growers. 
you take the pitial analysis, you send it to the lab, it comes back. And what it is telling you is that what is the nutritional status of the crop going to be like in basically 10 to 14 days? And then based on that, you can come back with a foliar feed. And in fact, that's what we've done with crops is we will come in and specifically target what is missing with a foliar feed. So that's very interesting. So, you know, it's going back, I, I, I explained in my last lecture that I started off as an extension horticulturist in Muskogee County. I was an ag agent in McIntosh County. I had a split county assignment there. Got a lot of really good experience and, and worked with a lot of great growers in a, in a really productive uh, part of, of Oklahoma. Lots of fruits and vegetable production. But uh, this is an example of a real simple soil test that they offer and, it, and, it, and just pointing out that it had the pH on there, had a buffer index, which tells you about how much lime you need, had the level of phosphorus, the level of potassium, but that is it. That was the standard soil test. And that's why farmers were asking like, what other kinds of information can we get? Now I should point out that you can ask for all this other stuff, it's extra. You just have to pay extra. Um, I will say, for example, where I, where I work at University of Kentucky has a very good soil test. It, it's got a, almost everything on here, but you have to request all of that um, in, in this, beyond the standard soil test. So anyways, that leads to this work I did with the ATRA Sustainable Ag Information Program, which was actually part of a nonprofit organization called National Center for Appropriate Technology. And ATRA was tasked with providing information to farmers and extension agents in all 50 states with sustainable agriculture and alternative agriculture that they cannot find elsewhere. And so in the early 1990s, we would get questions from farmers. Hey, where can I send my soil to a lab to get a more holistic test that tells me about the organic matter, about the humus, about the cow and exchange capacity and the base saturation? And this is what we came up with. So we've got a bunch of labs that do humus and microbial analysis and a bunch of labs that do chemistry and mineral analysis. But what's key here is that all of these are alternatives, soil testing, they're, they're geared to eco-agriculture. So you have a &L labs, uh, Brookside labs, Kinsey, Logan labs, uh, Spectrum, a lot of those are geared to the more along the lines of Albrecht analysis and then Crop Services International International Ag Labs, uh, um, et cetera. Those are more like Reams analysis. And then Texas Plant and Soil Lab had a totally different approach. They, had do, they use a carbonic um, acid analysis, which is unique and it's really helpful for, for Southwestern soils. So this is an example of a, a Perry Ag Lab uh, analysis of Albrecht. And um, you've got the anions like nitrogen, sulfate, phosphorus. You've got the cations like calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium. It tells you the cation exchange capacity, the percent organic matter, the pH. It tells you the range uh, that they occur in. And then the second part of that um, is the trace elements. And um, what's really common is to report boron, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, but then uh, nowadays people are also adding in cobalt, molybdenum, uh, silica, selenium. They're trying to get all that information. These tests will also show you the percent base saturation. And so there's a kind of an ideal ratio there of calcium to magnesium, a seven to one ratio. And let's see if I get my pointer over here. So then you got potassium, et cetera, sodium. And then it shows you a pie chart and, and, and um, all that information is very helpful and it leads to the ability to do a soil test recommendation or soil fertility recommendation. This is another example. This one is from Crop Services International. That was a lab that Phil Wheeler, he was a big consultant in Reams. He's retired and now it's run by, uh, by his, uh, you know, his, um, his follow-up company. And so that's an example of a soil test that you can get. So these things are really helpful. Farmers like them. They tell you a really good quick snapshot of your nutrient levels, and then it leads into what you can do to amend your soil. And then there's a number of books there. Um, I think I'll just go through those quickly that you've got various books that are good for Albrecht, like Gary Zimmer, Neil Kinsey, Don Schieffer, those are real Albrecht consultants, and then Mainline Farming for 
Century 21, Dan Scow and Phil Wheeler, those are both Reams kind of books. And then Victor Tesians was uh, with Rutgers University and he talked about calcareous soils and how to manage those at a really high percent calcium. And that is not considered to be a problem. That's actually an opportunity. Some of the best soils in the world are calcareous, but it's a different kind of uh, understanding too. The other thing is that for when you get into this, you really want to dig a little deeper. And so Midwest, uh, Midwestern Bioag, Gary Zimmer's groups put out the Soil Nutrition Handbook. ANL has an agronomy handbook. And then this guy, Greg Young, published Quality First in Vineyard and Orchard Production. So these are really helpful to dig a little deeper. And then what's then really things really exploded with a few different new books. And that is Bill Kibben's The Art and Balancing of Soil Nutrients. And what's interesting about this one is he actually has actual soil test reports from Logan Labs in the book and that shows you what a soil test looks like and then what you would do to amend that soil. Then Michael Estera came out with the ideal soil. This is, I think he had three different versions. This is the latest version he had. This really exploded things because for the most part, a lot of this knowledge was tied up in these four day seminars and consultants teaching students and farmers and really arcane equations. And so Astera made this available to everybody. Uh, and then um, Steve Solomon is a garden writer. He used to live in Northwest, Pacific Northwest. He's written several books. He's living in Australia now. And he took this information and made it more accessible to gardeners, the intelligent gardener. And again, he's got all the equations in there. And then he has a collaboration with a couple of people in California who are real, uh, also very interested in this uh, topic. And they're, they've developed a spreadsheet that's like an algorithm that, that crunches all these numbers. And for a really nominal fee, you can get online and submit soil samples and it will, will submit out, it will, you know, it'll, it'll spit out a soil report of what kind of minerals you need to amend your soil. So all that's very helpful to put in perspective. And that is, I, that's Astera's Ideal Soil. Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly just mention that and just move on in the spirit of time here. So this is an actual Kinsey report for a farm I worked with in Texas. This was a really large organic farm uh, near Austin. And so that is the kind of um, analysis and the, and the recommendations that would come back. So he's got protein nitrogen, He's got sulfur, potassium sulfate, iron sulfate, manganese, copper, zinc, and et cetera. You'll notice it says 400 pounds of iron sulfate. This is tell you what the soil needs. It's not telling you exactly like you have to do that. I mean, you, you're as a farmer, you can put down 25 pounds or 50 pounds, uh, but that's what the soil needs. And you, so you might do that over several years. This is uh, an example. This is the same farm that I was working with in so there's a really large farm, 200 acres organic farming. And so we um, put together a blend for 50 acres at a time. If you get a 22 uh, ton semi load of meat and bone meal or feather meal, you can calculate this out to deliver uh, roughly 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre over 50 acres. So we added in gypsum, potassium sulfate, some sulfur, uh, fertibor, which is boron, iron, copper, zinc, and put that, put that in there. When you do that, you're getting, like I said, close to 100 pounds of nitrogen, just over 100 pounds of phosphate and over 225 pounds of potassium. We needed that potassium because the irrigation water has sodium and you've got to offset that sodium and add more potassium. So this is the kind of thing uh, we're doing. Plus there's other things like you can side dress with feather meal on bare ground, or you can fertigate with plastic mulch and drip irrigation. There's ancillary products with fertigation and with foliar sprays. Uh, but you know, the, I present these at conferences and really the first thing that farmers will say is, yeah, that's great, but that's, that's pretty expensive and it is. Couple, I wanna say a couple of things there. One is that on these market farms and vegetable farms, they're, producing and, and at a really productive amount. And they're bringing in $25 or $50,000 an acre wholesale. So the mineral and fertility uh, 
approach is like the fundamentals of raising really nutritious crops and sell them to local farm, you know, the, the local farmers market, they taste good. But there are options. And so a couple of different options. One is to pull back on the full suite and then focus on some compost, some protein nitrogen to apply 75 to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and then focus on the most critical trace elements. That's usually boron and sulfur. Uh, so you would add some boron in there, and then you can use chelated trace elements instead of putting out 25 or you know, 30 pounds of some trace element per acre, you just do a foliar spray. And then uh, these like JH Biotech and Baycore, these are amino acid based trace elements. They are easily absorbed by plants. Uh, and then an, even a lower cost one is to get started and get something going is to drop off the compost and then go with a granular humate, which is like a lignite or linardite. Put that out there, 7,500 pounds of an acre, put out your nitrogen and then do foliar application and fertigation. So that's it. Uh, so then another option is to just go with a fertilizer blend that has everything in there. And um, point B in here, this one is an eco-ag product. It's not certified organic. So you gotta be aware of that. This one has a issue there with mono, mono ammonium phosphate. Uh, most everything in there is okay. So you have to be careful about that, what you're doing. Also, uh, we're gonna talk about biology, but it's really important to recognize the role of biology in making these minerals available. And then I wanna, I think I'm gonna run through the last part here pretty quick, Dan. So what the last part is, is that it helps sometimes to also, this is when you get into soil test and interpretation as a farmer, as a consultant, you have to understand the difference between actual phosphorus uh, in PPM, the pounds of actual phosphorus, and then also phosphates, because different labs will report these all different ways. So, uh, but if you look at a uh, low level of phosphorus, that's like 30 PPM. What USDA and NRCS says is that if you have 60 parts per million of phosphorus, you're doing okay, you don't need to add more. And if you do add more, you're susceptible to runoff. However, when you get into consulting and you actually are raising crops, what we like is actually these higher levels of phosphorus. So 90 parts per million of phosphorus is equivalent to oh, just a little over 400 pounds of actual phosphate per acre. Another example is taking a, a manure-based compost and getting the lab analysis and translating that into pounds of available nutrients. So this would be if you, this is an actual analysis of a compost. And uh, so you've got, um, you know, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. This is their percent actual amount, and this is the available. What we consider is that only 15, 20% of nitrogen really becomes available from compost. People say 30%, but it's actually probably closer to 15 or 20%. So you can calculate that out you're gonna get about 70% of available phosphate and 90% of available potassium. And these are called mineralization rates. So there's, I've got a whole table on that that explains all that. I should get that published by Acres USA. There's some other tricks. Uh, calcareous soils, like I've talked about, are tricky. There is a way to get a good test. It's the ammonium acetate test at, at pH 8.2. Because anyways, there's a long story there, but um, some good, good tips there if you're gonna send a sample to, to Logan Labs is get the AEA uh, base test. And uh, it also offers uh, things like the cobalt, silicon and molybdenum. So now I think I can wrap this up in about five minutes, Dan. So just in terms of applying, this is an example of a fertilizer spreader. And you know we put all these minerals in there and we got out there and lo and behold, this is, this is what really happens in the real world. This is like a windy day. And look at that, All everything that we're applying is not landing on the bed, it's landing over here. So this, this actually didn't work out too good. So what you can do is get your mineral blend. This has got your protein nitrogen, your minerals and trace elements, blend them all together into compost. 
and use compost as a, as a carrier to distribute evenly over the field. So this is a small scale, this is a market garden, and this is large scale. This is an actual working farm. And this is a pre-blended compost biofertilizer all blended together. So there's a soil test. It tells us what we need and the compost manufacturer actually blends all that for us. It's got the sulfur in there, copper and boron, whatever we need. And then you can evenly and accurately apply that. You can put that out at five pounds per acre, I mean, five tons per acre or, or 10 tons per acre very accurately on the bed and then incorporate it. Uh, there's ways to do side dress with uh, an old um, Farmall 140. You can also use the same thing with um, feather mill on bare ground. Uh, there's ways to do fertigation. There's lots of things you can stuff into fertigation. That means injecting fertilizers, humic acids, microbials into the drip line to feed the roots. And then finally is some kind of biosprayer. This is basically taking ag spray equipment and technology and turning it into a applications of biologicals and trace elements. Uh, so for example, microbial inoculants of any kind that you either prepare on the farm or you buy, et cetera. And this is, I actually did all this in Texas. We actually went around, sprayed pecan orchards, vineyards, pastures with a big spray rig like this and applied um, liquid compost extracts in a tank blend with microbials and soluble minerals, trace elements from seaweed and humates, et cetera. So that, I think that brings us to the end there, Dan. We did get through right around uh, 60 minutes. Good job, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. now we welcome everybody's uh, engagement. Thank you. Yeah, we're back. OK, cool. All right. Um, I've got Matt and Ashley both asking a similar question. Re loss of minerals. Many scientists dismiss the claim that minerals have been lost over time due to a change in modern analytical methods. Can you discuss this, please? So the, the question is, there's a question about the accuracy of that, right? Because right. Of, we're saying basically the story is, it's not that minerals have decreased, it's just we have a better way of testing now. There, there's a little bit of validity in that, but there's been some very solid papers on that. And actually there was uh, Don Davis um, published a really substantial paper in a couple different journals. And, um, has a, has a chart that shows that. And they did a really thorough statistical analysis, lots of sampling, et cetera. And they showed that, no, no, in fact, it really did, has decreased. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, analytical methods have definitely improved over, over decades in time. And, you know, you, you've got a, there's some truth to this, but, you know, do your own, do your own investigation. And I always say it's not the average, it's the variation. Right. What we found is that, you know, while but most of what's in the store is relatively low, the high quality is out there if you want to find it. So it's not about what the average is now versus what it was 50 years ago. You, you saw the, uh, I, I inserted those graphs yeah. that work, right? Yeah. On those yeah. right? Yeah, that was interesting. Yes. Yeah. So there's a lot of variation there. And like I said, there's, that is due to a lot of factors, geology, yeah. um, climate, uh, how much rainfall, um, Genetic, varieties, genetics, et cetera. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of variety there. So, but if you're in an area where you know that your soils are poorer than than a rich soil, you know you can amend back. Yeah, there's we're not we're not um, helpless in this. We actually. So uh, that question, uh, Dwight says, a soil lab for a geological soil test, please. Good, good question. Okay, so in you know it's always hard to to cover everything in one short hour, but there is an interest in several different kinds of soil tests. So one kind of a soil test is what they call a biological soil test. That would be like the reams. That's with the Morgan extract that was actually developed at University of Kentucky. It's a very solid universal soil extract, but it mimics the weak organic acids that would be released by a root to make a, a nutrients available from the soil. The second kind is more like a reserve kind of a test. That's like the Malik 3. It's a stronger acid. And it would tell you like what would be available on the exchange complex that the plant can interact, root can interact with the clay humus colloid and exchange nutrients. The, the last one, the third one is the total, true total soil nutrient level. That is like a geochemical mining assay. That is done with a material called aqua regia, which is a super duper strong 
uh, mineral. And so that's what uh, people, when they're, they're mining for gold and silver and stuff like that, so you can get a smorgasbord um, um, uh, analysis of, of dozens of elements uh, for the total. And some of the different consultants are using that. Hugh Level, who was with quantum agriculture, he just passed away a few months ago. That was his specialty. He did both the available from sort of like the Albrecht of Reims, and then he did the total. And then based on the spread of the total to the, you know, what, what you normally see on a, on a soil test, he was able to uh, interpret that and tell growers, like sometimes you can draw more from the total by using more biology and more energy. Okay. Yep. Uh, Sherry asks, what is your suggestion for the home gardener as far as soil testing? I don't understand what additives to add beyond compost. So the, I, will, I can suggest, for example, if you look up John Frank and he has a service that he works with gardeners for nutrient dense. And uh, yeah, you can do a soil test and then you can come back and add things. And I, I love doing home gardening and teaching home gardening. We usually do like a bed that's four feet wide by 15 feet long or maybe 20 feet long. And then that's, that gives you the square footage and then you can calculate all that out. You're putting on very small amounts of all these minerals per bed. It's not, it doesn't add up to very much. And you, you just add them in there along with the compost, incorporate them with the soil and use mulches and, you know, grow your crops. All right, uh, Linda asks, can plants take up toxic to humans levels of some or all minerals? They do. Uh, plants absorb all kinds of things from, from their environment. And so the, most important thing to say there is you would most all agricultural and garden soils do not have excessive heavy metals. However, if you're in an urban area that is has has formerly been in an industry, etc., those could be a concern. Uh, so yeah, there are ways to test for heavy metals, but in most instances, it's not a concern. But the question of taking them up, I mean, I understand that it has to do with the type of plant and the level of function of the mycorrhizae. Yeah, they, they will definitely take up plants. If you analyze a plant, it'll have your phosphorus, potassium, calcium, all that stuff. But it'll also have all kinds of other stuff in it. <laughs> and that's, that's what these trace, these rock dusts are talking about. It'll have beryllium in there, you know, that, you know, you don't even know that, but it's in there. All right, uh, Linda asks, um, how does one determine the legitimacy of a distributor of rock minerals, dusts and sea minerals, their purity, lack of contamination? How do I avoid the widespread microplastic contamination? Thanks. Okay, so that is a question that has not been answered yet. Microplastics, that's a whole nother new frontier of a, an environmental contaminant. Um, I can just say in general that most there's, you know, half a dozen different main rock dust, half a dozen different main sea mineral companies. I can say for sure that the sea mineral companies are very uh, meticulous about where they're sourcing their raw sea minerals. They go to really pristine areas to collect the seawater away from coastlines and stuff like that. Um, and then they do have a good laboratory analysis of what's in their sea minerals. But yeah, the microplastics is a whole new frontier. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're running long questions. I see uh, PR just put one in, but we've got about 20 minutes left. So people who are wanting to ask questions, feel free. Um, Jorben asks, long question here. How does it make sense to speak of an ideal soil looking only at its mineral composition if plant health slash nutrition mainly depends on soil biology? Can't the biology and soils with the ideal mineral composition be very different and therefore plant performance as well? Or does the chemical composition of soil strongly influence its biology? Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes to all of the above. Yes. That is true. The, the, in the next, soil biology- next lecture. <laughs> the, the soil biology is the is the new frontier, and I do want to make a point when I get around to to talking about that is that we there are some just remarkable 
outstanding new realizations about agroecology and about growing plants. And it's all from the new information from soil biology and the diversity and the abundance of soil biology and how critical it influences plant health and soil health. And obviously it leads into plant nutrition. So the, and I've, and so I've got some good things to say about soil biology in our next lecture, don't worry. But uh, the, the book called The Ideal Soil was from uh, Michael Ostera and he was adamant, he was adamant that the organic farming movement is, is cuckoo if it does not recognize the importance of minerals and trace elements. And that's what his soil test did for farmers. And like I said, he had, he did uh, the, the big pumpkin contest. I think someone asked me about that. I think I said it was there around 1600 pounds, but I think they're over 22 or 2400 pounds per pumpkin now. <laughs> so uh, no, he's had a number of converts uh, adopt soil minerals. Yeah. I think his first paragraph in that book was quite a uh, first chapter was was um, a great historical sort of context for the organic movement. Yeah. He did out, you know, Albrecht and and Rodale, et cetera, and, and where they sat in the in the context of each other. Let me just throw something out there. So uh, when I at one point I actually would dro drive like four hours to go to the University of Missouri. Uh, Columbia campus and go to the university library and actually would dig through the stacks and make photocopies of the bulletins that Albrecht published in the Air experiment station record. And years later, all of that is available online. You can actually get a, a lot of that from, you know, e-documentation through the digital repository at University of Missouri. But what became apparent was Albrecht was not advocating organic farming. He was, he was definitely advocating organic matter management and soil health through nutrition, but, and he used commercial fertilizers. That's what you'll find in equal agriculture. It's very compatible with organic farming, but it's not strictly codified like organic farming is. So there's a lot more flexibility in the farmer's toolbox to, for example, use ammonium sulfate. That's not allowed in certified organic, but it's, it's compatible with, with eco agriculture. That's a very important point. <laughs> yeah, another, another, another example, when I was digging through this um, material for this lecture on sea minerals, you know, you know, you can do a whole lecture, for example, on sea minerals by themselves, but Ro uh, Rodale, Robert Rodale in early 1960s, wrote an article in Organic Farming and Gardening Magazine about sea minerals. And he, he highlighted a gardener that was doing this and doing research on it, et cetera. So yeah, it goes back a long ways. All right, um, back to the questions. Emmanuel, any thoughts on using granite dust from granite kitchen counter manufacturers? Shy away from it. Because? Unknown source. Yeah. You don't know what they're using. I, I, I'd stick with a known source. And that's the okay. same thing. It's the same thing when people ask me about using uh, gypsum from industrial waste gypsum board. Totally. I'm like, mm, no, <laughs> stick with just mine pure gypsum. Yeah. And I would, say, I would say the same thing with the rock dust. Yeah. Now, if that was from a quarry and it was just quarry dust, that's different. That's just straight mined rock dust. But if they're using some kind of a surfactant or whatever, yeah, they, you don't know. It could be mixed in that there's a guy there Who's told not to mix in the uh, the shellac, you know, with the rest of the stuff, but it happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay. Let me let me share another story real quick. So now, trace elements, et cetera. You 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 know, in an, on a gardening level, you you do have to be careful. Uh, Graham Sate is one of the eco ag consultants with Nutritech Solutions in in Australia. He talked about an example of um, a outfit that does this thing where they mix the compost with the trace elements and they take them out and apply them onto farms. And so uh, the, the guy told the, the, you know, the, the foreman told the worker to put a bucket of molybdenum into the compost blend. So now does that mean a bucket, a five gallon bucket? 
or a, or a tractor a one cubic bucket yard, loader bucket. Does that mean a one cubic yard, uh, you know? Oh my God. Bulldozer load. Yeah. That's what the dude did. He put the yeah. bulldozer load in and it should have been a five gallon bucket. Yeah. Okay, now that resulted in a lawsuit because it totally overwhelmed the crop. It's way too much. So it, you do have to be cognizant, be careful that you're talking about some of these things like boron, for example, you definitely do not want to put on too much. But you should not shy away from that. I will say that, and I'll, and I'll just throw this out, really simple for, for almost every farm that's producing fruits and vegetables, you could put out one pound of boron per year easily. And you know, you got to calculate that out. That, that's like 10 that's pounds per acre. Of, per acre. 10, that's like 10 pounds of soluble. Yeah. Mixed into a foliar and sprayed over the soil or over the crop. That's what that is. That's one pound. But it's not 20 pounds or 50 pounds or 100 pounds. You have to be careful. Maybe three is good, but yeah, one for safe is pretty good. Yeah. All right, Michelle. Um, with the studies stating reduction in minerals correlating to increases in disease processes cross checked against human diet in general, changing between the 80s and now. Or was it just a simple comparison? I think that was a simple comparison. The, the, the table that showed the difference in the depletion of nutrients over time and the increase of degenerative diseases over time. Now there's a number of these, those are, that's known as a causation curve. Those are difficult to establish with, with a great amount of accuracy because there's many, many factors involved in those kinds of things. So it was a general concept table, not a you know, set in stone table. Um, Linda asks again, how different are brixometers? I think she means refractometers. How does the farmer choose the best for different crops? A re this refractometer are very common. That is a precision optical instrument. There's, it's a widely available. Generally for under $150, you can get a good quality one from a number of different sources even off of wholesale suppliers online. Um, so yeah, you can pretty re be reliable that they're good. Yeah, you can all, and then uh, like uh, one of the eco ag supply houses is called Pike Agri Lab Supplies. Yeah. So you just look online and look, look in Pike Agri Lab Supplies. They're actually up in Maine near, near Dan. Uh, yeah. has, has really solid instruments. Including That's where we get our presses from for our, our kits. You got to be able to squish the uh, whatever it is to get the, the drop of juice out for the refractometer. What I do for that, I actually go to this is kind of fun. I, I go hunting around for supplies at local hardware stores and actually went to a sort of a hardware store slash uh, food kitchen supply place and got an Epicurean garlic. Uh, press. <laughs> and that's what I use to squeeze plant uh, leaves and vegetables. And Pike's got the best. Pike's got the best. It makes a drop of, of juice yeah. onto the refractometer. And you look at it and it's like a prism. It's like the reflection of light through a prism. That's what tells you what it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Ellen asks resources for sea minerals. It's Resources, there's two things. There's a, there's a number of different literature sources. There's some, been a good series of articles that have been published in Acres USA. And then, like I said, there's probably a half a dozen of the key companies and, and probably no more than that really that sell the different sea minerals. So one of them is sold in a solids. Um, that one would be most commonly known as C90. That is actually a direct spinoff of Maynard Murray. Uh, uh, Robert Kane, who runs that company, actually was a worker with Maynard Murray in, in his hydroponic operation down in Florida. Uh, the other ones are actually sold as a solution in jugs that you dilute. You take the, the concentrate and dilute them out and then spray them. Um, and people can do that with any kind of sea salt, right? That's, that's correct, yeah. You would take the sea solid, you would dilute it in water and spray it out. Correct. Although uh, if you if you go back to the original thing that Maynard Murray did, he just spread the sea solids out in you know 250 pounds per acre, so, or or up to 750 pounds per acre, and you can do that, you should do the same thing if you're doing pastures or something like that. It's just easier to put it in dilution and spray it though. Not if you're walking through the woods, five yeah. gallon bucket. Yeah, 
And, and by the way, the, another, uh, another example, um, one of the other uh, tidbits I came across was an example of, and, and I should point this out, is that there's another practice uh, that is part of the humus management approach and soil biology approach is making compost. And that is adding rock dust to the compost windrow when it's being built. Yeah. And then it's, it's blended into the compost. Level, of course. Yeah, and, and, and you do the same thing with sea minerals. You could, you could sprinkle or spray sea minerals or add sea solids to the compost at the building stage. When this is all blended together, the microbes will take these trace elements, they will use them as enzymatic cofactors, and they will make and solubilize and make things happen. So they can solubilize the minerals and rock phosphate and make them more available and more chelated. So these minerals then become available to the plants when they're applied to the field as a compost. This is really, that's real high end. Um, well, I'm just gonna give you a, a uh, you know, <laughs> a left field one. So Hugh passed recently. And at the end of your last workshop, the thing that people seemed most interested in was the energetics. So this seems like a perfect opportunity for you to comment on Hugh just honoring who he was and energetics and minerals. Okay, sure. So Hugh Level was he was a he was a farmer down in Georgia, northern Georgia. I've actually been down to his place to visit, and those soils are what they call red clay soils, and uh, they're very very clay, um, very sticky. And you go out to his garden; it was just like rich brown, uh, aggregated soil. So his methods were solid, and he would show up at conferences. He would bring food from his from his farm, like hot sauce or cornmeal or whatever. And farmers gravitated to Hugh because he talked about things in a real insightful way, but you know, he demonstrated this all works. His system was called quantum agriculture and is really very similar to eco agriculture. It was the integration and balance of minerals, biology and energy. But Hugh's specialty was probably for sure the quantum agriculture. He, he developed um, a, a uh, field broadcaster, which is kind of a kind of a radionic device that that balances atmospheric and earth energies. He used the biodynamic preparations. He taught radionics at all the conferences, and uh, yeah, that was his thing. And he's you know his comment was that these are all natural. You know we're bombarded. By the way, we are bombarded every day constantly by cosmic rays from the sun and from the planets. And so there are hydrogen molecules hitting every square inch of the earth every second at the speed of light every day. So these are, these are natural energies. And so what Hugh said is why not take advantage of these earthly and terrestrial, I mean, these terrestrial and cosmic energies. And you know, recently passed one of the elders I would consider in the ecoag community. He passed his wife Shabri Bird is, is really well known on her, in her own way. She was married to Christopher Bird, who Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird both wrote the Secrets of the Soil and Secrets of the Plant. And uh, and Christopher Bird traveled all around the country interviewing innovators in, in agriculture and, and writing about all that. And so that's seventies. She's uh, she's uh, continuing on. She's got she's still running the quantum ag business. And as it pertains to um, rock dusts in compost piles, wasn't that part of what Hugh was bringing forth? He may have I forget, uh, but you know the the Lubke compost, the humified compost. They use, they promote the use of basaltic rock dust in the compost, and like I said, that's why I know about all this uh, because you know I've thought about that. Is that you've got trace elements in relatively inert rock material that you integrate with an organic medium like compost. It has a gazillions, quadrillions of microbes. They're all producing organic acids and enzymes as a natural process of their cellular metabolism. They can actually take inert rock material and etch yeah. out phosphate out of it. And they can take that phosphate and, 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 and put it into an organic form that's tied into the compost organic matter that is applied to the soil that becomes available. The same thing is done. This has been done in many different dozens of, of scientific journal articles that have investigated putting in rock phosphate into compost. 
colloidal yeah. rock phosphate. Yeah, regular rock phosphate that's mined from the earth. You put it in compost, it goes through the process and through microbial metabolism, it makes that phosphate bioavailable. That's equivalent to single superphosphate, which is 10% phosphate. Yeah, it's all very thoroughly proven. Yep. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, let me see. Uh, Sherry asks, could you add a kelp to your soils or compost? Kelp, yes. Kelp is another one. Kelp and seaweed and seaweed extract are all known because of the fact that they come from the ocean and they have been exposed to this over 70 different elements that exist in ocean water. And they absorb that into their tissue. And so there is a really good source of trace elements and also these ultra trace elements. So uh, kelp meal is very popular as a livestock feed in eco agriculture, in organic farming, in regenerative grazing. You just add, add, add some kelp meal as a choice mineral for the livestock to feed on. And even if you're a worker, like, you know, we, you know, farmers, we work out in the hot sun. Uh, sometimes you just take your finger and dip it in your, you know, get your mouth and get it wet and just take a little dip of kelp meal and put it in your mouth. It'll really just, you know, give you a little bit of extra um, boost, you know, in the hot summer, you're working, you're sweating. That one's a good one. Uh, so, yeah. I always talk about kelp as, you know, part of its value is the, the uh, trace elements, but part of it's the growth hormones. And if you look at some of the um, what do they call invasive species like uh, kudzu or bittersweet or in Japanese knotweed? They have the same functional, vigorous, rapid growth, full of growth hormones. Wasn't it that which the um, How to Grow World Record Tomatoes Charles Wilbur was using to make his compost? Do you want to tell people about that story from the Eco Ag? You, you didn't tell me that, but no, I think I know that. You know. Yeah. yeah. Well, Charles Wilbur, you know, he was a farm boy from Alabama and he wanted to be in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's one of it's one of the uh, you know Acres books. It's a picture. Okay. Right. And he uh, made kudzu compost and okay. this tomato plants four feet apart and had you know 28 foot tall towers and had 1200 pounds of fruit on four plants. Wow. But it was you know people think about using kelp as a you know, it stimulates plant growth. It's the, you know, the, the cytokines and the auxins, the growth hormones, right. not just the trace elements, but we have the invasive species that we can make weed teas out of, kudzu or Japanese knotweed or, you know, any, any of these viney invasive plants have those same compounds that kelp has. Right. And we can harvest them and use them. Yeah, that's great. Love it. So anyway, um, yeah, uh, let me see. <clears throat> um, PR says, I have lead in the soil right around the house. Does this leach to the rest of the soil? Um, phosphorus lockup, that whole piece about if you do have actually toxins in the soil and plant availability. Did, she, did they say lead? Yeah, lead. Okay, yeah. That, to be, you know, we should be careful that. And I, and I mentioned urban areas and yeah, the couple things there. One is that they call brownfields. Uh, some of the urbanized areas in, in the larger cities have formerly a, a history of past industrialization. Those are called brownfields. Those, those you should be aware of. And then around homes, around older homes that had lead paint, et cetera, um, some people have flower beds right next to the home. You should be aware of that too. And what some of the pioneers, Will Allen, he, was, um, he, he used to show up at a lot of these conferences and he's, you know, he's, he taught farmers all over the place how to do this. But he always said, in urban areas, in brownfield areas, you always build up. You, you always build your raised beds up off the soil and to raise in, in those instead of in the soil because of the lead and, and other things. And there's other nuances there about how to tie it up and leaves versus fruits and things like that. But it is a concern for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're, we're approaching the end of the time, but. Um, any final yeah, hope that was helpful for everybody. Uh, it was you know, it was a quick quick overview there of mineralization, but I think it really gives people the perspective. Um, and so the next one is in May. This is the one we're going to get into: biology, soil food web, 
all kinds of interesting, exciting things that are going on in that area. And so we'll, we'll look forward to getting back together again. Great, getting the thank yous, but thank you, Steve. Okay. All right. Good to see you again, Dan. Yeah, be well.